Good morning, friends. In Sunday's message, we considered the foolishness of the young women from our Lord's parable whose one job was to act as light bearers in the wedding processional. And yet there were some of those young women who did not even bring any oil to fuel their lamps. And we talked briefly about how we might actually be a bit uncomfortable with the fact that Jesus himself, whom we always think of as being humble and meek and kind and never saying a stern word, that he would actually be willing to label these young women as foolish, using a word that quite literally means stupid. In light of that fact, we did remind ourselves that the primary purpose of the parable was that we would use the parable to examine ourselves, such that if any labeling were to take place, it would really be us labeling ourselves, because our Lord's point is not to hand us a stick to beat other people with, you know, breaking them down or whatever else, but rather to have an honest assessment of ourselves. But having said that, we do need to realize that stupidity and foolishness exist in this world. As the psalmist declares, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And this means a time might come when we are faced with someone that we love, a family member, a a lifelong friend, whoever it might be. And we need to lovingly and compassionately implore that person to not be that fool to not be the person who is making the, the, the greatest quote unquote mistake. They're doing the most stupid thing they could do in terms of denying God, even if it sounds harsh to speak to that person and, and to be face to face with them and to communicate to them the idea that they are acting the fool. Now, we should never be purposely harsh with anyone, especially if we are doing so to get some pleasure out of being harsh. Of course not. But the simple truth is that sometimes the reality can be harsh because there's some things that people don't want to hear. There's things we don't want to hear, things we don't like considering, things that offend us because we don't want them to be true. We don't want to accept them as true. And actually, the gospel itself is one such thing, right? I mean, the apostle Peter likens Jesus himself as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The apostle Paul says that the cross is folly to those who are perishing. And in Galatians 5.11, that the message of the cross is offensive to people. And so we must guard ourselves from any notion that we must stay away from any topic or any message that might be received as offensive by someone. Because if that were the case, we'd have to stay away from the gospel message itself. And sadly, this is what many churches do, so-called churches at the very least, in order to not offend people and therefore to as a, as a means to get people through the doors and to keep them, many churches have watered down the gospel such as to soften or outright get rid of any of those offensive elements in them. Things like the reality that people are sinners and that they rightly deserve condemnation, which is why they need the gospel. You know, but but people don't want to hear that bad news of their own sin, even if it's required to then receive the good news. People are offended by the truth that they're sinners, and they don't like that. They don't want to hear that, and so, so churches so often have gotten rid of that part of the gospel. And of course, if you get rid of that part of the gospel or any part of the gospel, then you don't have a gospel anyway anymore. In any case, there are truths in God's word that are offensive to people, but we still need to be willing to declare them because they are true. And since these things do come from God's word, then it's the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit can and will use those, those truths to do his work. For it is through hearing the word of God that people come to faith by the power of the Spirit. Let me share with you one big example. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples in power, Peter ends up giving that famous day of Pentecost sermon. And he opens the main body of the sermon by saying, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
And then he concludes by saying, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, this is not the kind of preaching we're used to, is it? It is direct, point blank, in your face. Peter is calling out the egregious sin of his listeners in great detail. He's not softening anything. He's not putting the situation into a hypothetical uh, arena or just using general terms so that no one feels singled out. No, he says, this man, Jesus, whom you crucified whom you saw all his makers, uh, miracles, whom you knew was from God. And he even includes that jab about how they use lawless men to do it, which is a reference to the Romans, of course, who as Gentiles had not received the law of God and therefore were lawless in that sense. And so as rebellious as the Jewish people had been, they would normally despise those who were lawless in that way. And yet Peter points out that in their sin against God and crucifying Christ, they were even willing to join forces with the lawless Gentiles. So Peter is being what our modern sensibilities would consider highly offensive, He's being judgmental (laughs) in the extreme. He's saying, you have done this horrible sin. He's making it abundantly clear that the people are guilty of committing the greatest crime against God, a holy God, that could possibly be committed. And Peter, for his own part, is not doing anything to lessen the impact of that reality. He's not trying to soften that truth. He's just simply speaking the truth to them. And I dare say many of us today would say that's not how you approach people. That's not how to win people. And yet, what happens as Peter concludes his message? Well, we're told, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Please notice Peter did not invite people down front for an altar call. He didn't lay out the way of salvation before concluding the message. He actually just laid out the plight of the people. He just revealed to them the reality of their situation before God. Instead of having someone play soft music in the background and 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 going into a time where he tries to woo people, you know, to to Christ, you know, to to raise your hand to invite Jesus into your heart. No, Peter just he speaks the truth about their sin and how they have offended the God of the universe, and he just kind of leaves them hanging there to consider the reality of their situation. And and it's with that, on account of that, that the people actually go to him and to the rest of the apostles asking, what shall we do? Reading between the lines, we now understand how deserving we are of condemnation. Is there any hope for us? Is there any forgiveness? Is there any way of salvation? You see, Peter did not spoon feed them the message of salvation. He He didn't lay it all out, you know, in the simplest terms possible, and then say, you know, it's so easy, it'll just take five minutes of your time, as if it were really no big deal. No, he spoke the truth, even if that truth would be offensive to some. Because to to those in whom the Holy Spirit was working, those offensive words that outlined their need for forgiveness because of their great sin, those words were the very power of God to lead them to salvation so that the people themselves cry out, what shall we do? And the answer returns, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And again, my point is not to say that we should adopt a sort of belligerence in our evangelism. I'm not saying that the truths we're discussing today gives us the opportunity to be purposefully offensive or to be more offensive than is necessary, simply because we don't really like being compassionate in the first place and now we have an excuse to not be compassionate. No, due to mankind's sinful nature, they receive, we receive the gospel and truth as offensive, uh, as being offensive enough as it is. We don't need to add offense by our own belligerence, our own callousness or insensitivity. But at the same time, we can't not express the truth of the gospel simply because we don't want to cause offense. 
because offense will be involved if we do what God has called us to do. Remember that while so many people did repent and believe on the day of Pentecost, there were also those who sneered and claimed that the disciples of Christ were merely drunk. And we read through the rest of the book of Acts, and we see the same thing happened wherever the Apostle Paul went. Some people would hear his words, his just plain spoken, this is the truth, you know, kind of language, and they would be convicted and they'd become believers, but there would be others that would scoff. Others that would just reject, that would be offended and would walk away. And that's just the way it is. And so we must not shrink away from the truth, even if people may receive it as offensive. Rather, we must speak it boldly. And yes, as gently and compassionately as possible, but still, we must speak it fully without compromise. We cannot act as if we are going to sand off the rough edges of God's word. That would be like saying, God, I know, you, I know how you do things, but I think I have a better way perish the thought. So we have a narrow road to walk. We must speak the truth in the knowledge that the truth will be offensive to many, but we must speak that truth in a way that no one can have any legitimate claim that is a legitimate claim before God, that the reason they're offended is because it's something we've done. Okay. In a sense, we could say, let the gospel be offensive, but for our part, may we never be. Or to put it yet another way, if someone is going to reject the gospel, let it be because they're rejecting the offensiveness of the gospel itself, not the offense of the messengers of the gospel. Because again, there's no getting away from the fact that sinful men and women, just like us, will naturally find the word of God offensive. But it is still the word of God that converts the heart and mind through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so that is precisely what we, we must give them. With that, I pray you have a good and godly day, and Lord willing, I will see you soon.